How's it going, everybody? Dan here once again, and um, I've actually got a sequel this time to uh, my previous video. My previous video, I did 10 films that I particularly didn't care for, but everybody else seems to love. So I figure I might as well do it the, the opposite way, and in this video, I'm going to be doing 10 movies that I particularly enjoyed, but everybody else seems to hate. Or more specifically, like, critical response wasn't really that good, or critics loved it, but a lot of people hated it, or just everybody seems to hate this movie. But I myself did get a kick out of it. Uh, again, like with my previous film, this list is in no particular order, except for number one. Number one is there for a reason, I assure you of that. Uh, also, just like with my previous video, I uh, I do have a script on the screen here, so that way I'm not getting too far off track. But let's get into it. Uh, number 10, we've got The Time Machine from 2002. Now, it does take a departure from the novel. It does take a departure from the original film, which followed the novel pretty well. But what was done here was actually pretty good. What I really liked about this remake is the fact that the time traveler had a motive this time. In the book and in the original film, he really only built the time machine just out of curiosity. That was the only reason why he did it. Whereas in this one, he does have a reason to want to build a time machine. I won't go into any spoilers, but let's just say it gives you a really, really good reason to think about what if at number nine we've got red dawn the 2012 remake now this is one i actually saw this in the theaters with my brother joe and he and i went into this thinking for sure it was gonna suck and we were actually very pleasantly surprised it was pretty good it wasn't perfectly faithful to the original from the 80s, but it was a pretty decent update that is kind of relevant even in this day and age. I would say my biggest complaint with the remake was the ending. Like, the ending of the remake, it's just, you know, oh, the war rages on, here we go, we're gonna beat these guys. Whereas, a uh, spoiler alert, in case anyone hasn't seen the original... In the original Red Dawn, they show the boulder that the Wolverines were using to carve the names of their fallen comrades into. And it's got an American flag planted on top. There's a memorial plaque in front, you know, as if to say, you don't know where, when, or how, but ultimately America prevailed. I would have liked something like that in the remake. Just some way to show you, you don't know where, when, or how, but ultimately the United States won the day. Once again, good tea, by the way. Uh, coming in at number eight, we've got Mannequin 2 on the move. Now, not to be confused with the original film that starred Andrew McCarthy and Kim Cattrall, that was actually a really good movie. You talk to anyone who's seen it, and they will have very fond memories of it, specifically the scene at the end where um, uh, the guy's got the fire hose and he's just hose it down, security guy. He's like, this is what being a man is all about, honey! Whereas in, in the sequel, the only person from the original mannequin that actually comes back is Mishosh Taylor as uh, Hollywood Montrose, the effeminate window dresser. Other than that, it's a completely different cast. And... Mannequin 2 is one of those movies, how do I say this, it's so cheesy that it's just awesome. It's definitely, it definitely fits the definition of, it's so bad, it's good. <laughs> Coming in at number 7, we've got Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Excuse me. Again, as I mentioned in my previous video when I was talking about the movie Grease, I like 1950s culture. So, I'm going to like the idea of an Indiana Jones movie that's set in the 1950s, and it features an older and wiser indie. 
I like the fact that, you know, okay, now he's fighting the Soviets instead of the Nazis. Alright, it, 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 the movie got really weird towards the end, like, with the whole, like, interdimensional thing and aliens. And it got a little weird for me. And, yes, I know, I know, nuke the fridge. Okay, I'm willing to accept that in Indiana Jones film, there's always going to be some segment where you just have to suspend your disbelief. You're like, oh yeah, right. Like, that's going to work in real life. Now, I had heard, like, I had heard going into when I saw this movie that there's a scene in Crystal Skull where, oh my god, they actually had Indiana Jones survive a nuclear explosion. <laughs> And then when I see it playing out where he's in the test town, and he's, I'm like, and he's getting into the fridge, I'm like, no! 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 They're not gonna do this, are they? Oh my god, I can't, oh my god, just... Next, next movie, next movie. Number six. Staying similar to that, number six, we've got Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that they hated this movie. Primarily because Kate Capshaw was particularly annoying with her portrayal as Willie Scott. Okay, I admit it. I admit it, I come clean. When I was a child, Kate Capshaw was one of my celebrity crushes. Specifically as Willie Scott. She was so beautiful in that movie. Like, every, every outfit, like, from the, like, the nice sequins fitted red dress in the beginning number where she's singing Anything Goes, to, like, like, like the, like, the princessy look and the dinner party with all, like, the jewelry and the veils and whatnot. Even the, the sacrificial garb when she's gonna be sacrificed. She looks like a bride of Kali. Oh my god, she looked awesome in that one. As for the film itself, it was okay, okay, there's no Nazi fighting or anything, but it ha it fit the tone. I mean, really, it was a prequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's got, like, this gritty 1930s serial vibe going on, and I liked it. I thought the story was pretty good. You know, like, like there's an element of the supernatural involved. There's a, a horde of bad guys that Indy's got to fight. All right, all right, that's another one. A lot of people are, have complained that, you know, it's very racist in its portrayal of Indians. I'll admit it isn't exactly flattering towards Indian people, but to be fair, I don't think that that was Steven Spielberg's intent. I don't think he was doing it, like, to, like, insult anyone. I think he was just doing it for the purpose of telling a good story. And to that end, I have to say Steven Spielberg did his job. Moving up to number five, we've got Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Again, this is a movie I'm not so sure very many people know of its existence. No disrespect to Sarah Michelle Gellar. I'm pretty sure she was great as Buffy. I, I only saw, like, one episode of the TV series. But if it wasn't for Christy Swanson playing Buffy in this film, I don't think Sarah Michelle Gellar would have been a household name. The movie, it had, like, like that grungy, gritty, like, early 90s valley girl feel to it. And you get to see Christy Swanson as Buffy kicking some serious ass. And I still can't get over the fact that that one vampire gets his arm chopped off. I still can't get over that that's Paul Rubens. I never knew that. I'm like, when I heard about that years later, I'm like, wait a minute. That was Paul Rubens? That was Pee Wee Herman? Holy crap, I didn't even recognize him. Number four. Godzilla 1998. Yeah. Somebody out there probably just went like, Really? Really, Dan? You liked that movie? Yeah, I did. It didn't capture the spirit of Godzilla the way I would have liked it to. You know, giant monsters beating the crap out of each other. But what was done was actually done fairly well. I Two things that really get me with that movie. One, 
the scene at the end inside Madison Square Garden was done pretty well. I liked the suspense that it had. And secondly, most importantly, excuse me again, Godzilla 1998 made me care about the characters. I ended up rooting for Matthew Broderick as Dr. Mononucleosis. Yeah, I know. It's Tatopolis. Whatever. I'm just going to call you Bob, okay? I was rooting for him. I, I wanted to see him, like, reconcile with Audrey. Um, Harry Shearer is, um... Oh, God, I can't remember his character's name, but... Kent Brockman from The Simpsons is playing a smarmy newscaster. And, oh my god, he was perfect for it. It's like Kent Brockman was a live-action character, and it worked, too. Number three, we got Howard the Duck. This movie's always had a soft spot in my heart when I was a kid. Of course, when I was a kid, duck tits went way over my head. I didn't even catch that. And neither did the scene where Howard is in bed with Beverly. I didn't get that either. But I thought the visual effects were decent. Uh, at the end, when Howard's got to fight the Dark Overlord of the Universe... That was actually really well done. I thought the Dark Overlord was, like, very, very well animated, like, really good stop-motion work. And the story wasn't that bad. <clears throat> I, I, I can't do it. I can't say that I hate that movie, because I loved it. I thought it was great. Number two, we got... Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead. Yeah, critics didn't seem to like this movie. I can't understand why. I, most people think of Christina Applegate as Kelly Bundy from Married with Children. I will remember her as Sue Ellen Crandall from Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. She was an absolute joy in this movie. I, I liked that it's got that, like, kind of like, end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s feel going on. Alright, alright, the plot kind of goes out the window about like a half hour, 40 minutes into the film, and it's really not brought up again until the end. But the story was decent enough. The music was awesome. I I'm an audiophile. Any movie that's got good music, probably going to get some bonus points in my book. So yeah, number two, don't tell mom the babysitter's dead. And finally, we got number one. Now once again, this list was in no particular order except for number one. This one is here for a reason. Like, the critics absolutely hated this movie. It, it lasted like two weeks in the theaters. But my bond with this movie... It's just completely and utterly unbreakable. I'm sure somebody out there has already figured out what it is. Number one, Cool World. I loved this movie. I loved it. The first hour of Cool World was great. Like The animation was great. The music was phenomenal. It had, like, this really, like, almost like, like, like a jive animation, like, really good rotoscoping. Um, it had, like, this really good, like, sexy, naughty vibe going on. Let's face it, Hollywood is friggin' gorgeous. I prefer her over Jessica Rabbit. But the, the last half hour, 40 minutes or so... The movie just literally falls off a cliff. For the first hour, it's building up nicely. It's building up to... Uh, I can't believe I'm going to do this. Uh, I am about to make this pun. I won't spoil it in case you haven't seen it. But 
for the first hour or so, the movie is building up to a climax. And then after the movie climaxes, it just descends, and then it just falls off a cliff in like the last ten minutes. But the things I loved about the movie, it just, it will be forever near and dear to my heart. Like, I was 12 years old when I first saw the movie, and uh, the song that played over the opening credits uh, was called Play With Me by the Thompson Twins. I'll actually put a link to it in the description. First time I heard that song, okay, I was 12 years old, I was completely and utterly mesmerized by it. It was stuck in my head. I, ha I actually have it on a CD. I burned it onto a disc. To this day... I still catch myself driving up to work, playing it on loop. But there's one more thing that enamors me to Cool World. There's one more thing. And I'm actually going to be grabbing the camera. And I'm going to be showing everyone. We're going to step out of my Fortress of Solitude. Step in here. And there she is. Say hi to Holly, everyone. Hi, Holly. Yeah, I, I saw this thing on eBay, and I just had to have it. I just had to have it. It's supposed to be a clock, but the clock, unfortunately, doesn't work anymore. I don't care, though. I love it. So that, ladies and gentlemen, that is my list of uh, ten films that I personally enjoyed, but everyone else seems to hate. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Again, I've probably provoked a discussion or an argument or two. But I'd like to hear what everybody else thinks. Until next time, though, this is Dan, checking out.